Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to tonight's um, meeting for the City of San Fernando Citywide Parking Management Master Plan. I'm Catherine Padilla, and I'll be your facilitator tonight. And uh, we will begin the meeting now. Uh, thank you for attending. Before we start, we're going to go over some uh, ways of how to participate in tonight's meeting. You should know that this meeting is available in Spanish and English. So, and you should also know that it's being um, recorded. So it will be available to be watched on demand um, on the city YouTube channel, as you can see from this slide and on the project website. So we'll provide this information to you again at the end of the meeting. So you know what our next steps are and how to stay in touch. Uh, again, Spanish interpretation is available by clicking on the interpretation button at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar. So if you hold your cursor, you'll see at the bottom, it, there's, um, it looks like a globe or a, wor a world um, symbol and it says interpretation, just click on that. And then when we get to the question and answer portion, we're going to ask you to submit your comments and questions, please, using the Q&A function. Again, that's located on the bottom of your screen. And tonight, we also have um, people who are joining us by phone, or if you wish to text your questions and comments as we go through the meeting, you can do that, and we'll respond to your questions as well. And that text number is 818-810-7312. Um, Seven three one one, and again, you can text your questions or comments anytime during the meeting, and we'll get back to you um, during the meeting. Again, the phone number is eight one eight eight one zero seven three one one. So please feel free to submit your questions that way as well. We'll go on to the next slide, please. Now, keep in mind, this meeting is intended to have two-way communication. That, that means that we provide information to you and you provide information to us. So here's the agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, we'll begin with a welcome and that will um, be presented by um, Nick Kimball, who is the city manager, your city manager. Uh, and then we'll go through the meeting purpose and format that will be presented by Brian Marchetti. And he is the project manager from KOA who is overseeing the study on behalf of the city. Brian will continue with the presentation um, about what we've learned so far. And then we'll open it up to questions and answers. After questions and answers, we'll go through again the next steps in the study. And the other thing that we'll do is present a slide that shows how to stay in touch after the meeting as well. So we'll continue to the next slide. And um, actually, we're going to ask Mr. Uh, Kimball to present, uh, to welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, my name is Nick Kimball. I am the city manager for the city of San Fernando. Uh, and I would like to welcome everyone watching and thank you for participating in tonight's public meeting to discuss the city's efforts to develop a parking management master plan. For a number of years, City Council has directed staff to pursue funding to conduct a parking study to begin to address some of the parking challenges we experience citywide. In mid-2019, the city was awarded a grant from the Southern California Association of Governments to prepare a citywide parking management master plan to collect parking data and develop recommendations to better manage the city's residential and commercial parking supply. In late 2019, through the grant, the city engaged the services of a team of parking and management, parking management and planning experts led by the firm KOA to assist the city with developing a parking ma management master plan. In a monumental stroke of bad timing, the kickoff meeting for this project was on March 17, 2020, the day after the city declared an emergency in response to the growing COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so COVID-19 has presented a number of, of data collection challenges um, and the consultant he held off on conducting parking counts for as long as possible to get a baseline measurement of parking data that somewhat resembled normal conditions. Unfortunately, in early 2021, SCAG required that the city move forward with the pro project or risk losing funding. The consultants were able to hold off a bit longer and most of the data collection 
was conducted in late February after some restrictions had been lifted. Although some of the parking data is not completely representative of normal conditions, primarily in the commercial areas of the city, there are still many useful recommendations and conclusions that will come out of this effort. Public meetings like the one you're participating in tonight are critical to ensuring that you as a resident and stakeholder in San Fernando stay informed and have a voice in the city's efforts to address parking challenges. KOA has prepared a thorough presentation to update the public on the current status of this project and will be available to answer questions and take feedback from participants. Again, I would like to thank you all for taking an interest in San Fernando and providing thoughtful feedback. I will now turn the presentation over to the consultant team to begin the presentation. Thank you, Nick. So we have we have the slide on the on the screen. We wanted to wanted to show you what what the goals of of your attendance is is here today. Um, is, is to provide a, provide us input um, in a, in a number of areas where where you live, where you work, if if those are both in the city of San Fernando. Uh, so we'll have a we'll have a question and answer period um, after we present um, the project and the data that we've collected so far. And then we'll talk about our next steps as we as we analyze the data further. But I want you to be thinking about how do you, what are ways to improve commercial parking? What are ways to improve uh, residential parking? Uh, these are primarily the on-street parking areas on the on the public roadways, uh, the downtown city lots. Uh, what neighborhoods and areas have low parking availability? And we like to kind of hear as you talk about the issues of what you feel your neighborhood is and kind of those boundaries, because what we want to do is as we get further into the data is to start start looking at how how the neighborhoods work as a whole in terms of the parking supplies and the and the kind of the sub districts of the of the commercial neighborhood. So uh, and then want to hear from you what solutions are best based on each area and we're going to talk about potential tools that are available. Um, some of those might be might be obvious to you. Some might might not be, but we'll we'll talk about the potential tools that can be applied and and get your opinions on on uh, where those where those could be implemented. We move to the next slide. So I'll introduce um, the overall overall team to you. We have a we have a few groups that have that have joined this project as a as a cohesive team to get this project done. I'm Brian Marchetti with. with with KOA, uh, we're transportation planners and, and engineers. Um, our goal, our, our role in the project is, is project management for the city, but also conducting, managing the parking data analysis, uh, looking at potential solutions. And then uh, we have Catherine Padilla and Associates. Uh, we have a, a few members of their team with us tonight, including Catherine Padilla, Thelma Herrera, Jomel Roselle, and Melba Novoa. Uh, there with us tonight, um, doing various functions, including uh, interpreting on our parallel uh, Spanish channel uh, for this meeting and, and logging comments. Uh, JR Parking Consultants, uh, Janice Rhodes is here with us tonight. She's providing specialty um, expertise on parking management and pricing. Uh, pricing is only one tool, uh, but, but where that can be applied or changed, uh, she has that expertise for us. Um, you may have seen uh, surveyors going about town in um, late February, it was. Um, and there were, there were a couple phases to the data analysis, and we'll talk about that. But we had national data and surveying services um, helping us uh, with the data collection in the field, both inventorying spaces and parking regulations, but also taking a record of, of occupancy on, on four different uh, time periods. So we will, uh, we will go over that. On, on later slides. Uh, Nick Kimball introduced himself. Also with this is Matthew Baumgartner, the city engineer, um, who has uh, been a, also an integral part of the project on the city side. So some of the ob objectives and the, the project, um, you know, the planned benefits of the project. Um, one of the objectives is engaging community members and stakeholders. Um, we've had um, individual kind of focused stakeholder meetings uh, with with residential uh, with a residential group uh, with a commercial uh, business group and uh, getting all that input together including tonight um, we're gauging in, in problem solving for for parking solutions doing doing that together 
we don't have any preconceived notions of, of what solutions there are. Uh, we're talking this through through those stakeholder meetings and this community meeting tonight. Um, the project supports efforts to stimulate local economies, uh, revitalizing commercial districts where that's desired. Uh, commercial areas and parking supplies need to need to work together. If they don't, then it's it's not a it's not a healthy uh, commercial district, uh, commercial economy. And so we'll we'll be looking at ways to to help that uh, work better, both in the downtown area and in in the commercial other commercial corridors such as such as McClay. Uh, we're going to be incorporating some of the findings in terms of um, future land use from the San Fernando Corridor specific plan that was completed a, a couple of years ago by the city. Um, also looking at the potential future station site um, near the Civic Center for the San Fernando Valley East, East San Fernando Valley Light Rail project, uh, which has a planned station uh, near the Civic Center to both look at the potential impacts of that, how to manage parking around that station, but also um, when, when new land uses come in to take to take advantage of that station location, how to, how to manage that as, a, as its own small commercial district. But overall, uh, we're looking at focused and holistic uh, parking solutions, um, community-wide benefits, uh, citywide effects. Um, we're not gonna look at any types of improvements that are, that are so small they don't have a great effect on the larger area or just create uh, spillover impacts in, into other areas. We wanna look at holistic uh, parking solutions and and uh, the city has not has not embarked on this type of study before so we're hoping that this will be a new way for the city to to manage um, its entire parking supply um, and create benefits for both businesses and, and residents so this is our this is our project study area we've we've rotated um, the the city a little bit to, to have uh, roadways such as brand Boulevard here uh, McClay Avenue, those those run from, from top to bottom in this map. Uh, Hubbard Street here on the left side of the map, the downtown area, Truman Street, San Fernando Road, uh, running through the middle, uh, Glen Oaks uh, Boulevard up here on the north. Uh, the 118 freeway is on the right side and the 5 freeway is on the south side. So we'll be showing you some data uh, using this same map orientation, but rather than saying north and south, east to west, which could be in conflict with how, how you see your roadways, <laughs> uh, we will, we will uh, say, say uh, up, up and down and, and side to side. And we'll, we'll point that out a little bit better to make it clear so we don't create any confusion as we identify where your, where your issues are. So our, our project study area, all of these uh, roadways in the city, any, any public roadway in the residential area, uh, the commercial area, those were all included. Uh, the off street uh, city, city run parking lots in the, in the downtown area were included. Um, we looked at, um, we looked at the demand in um, private off street commercial lots too along these major corridors, which are shown in blue such as McClay, Glen Oaks, San Fernando Mission Boulevard, et cetera. Uh, we, we looked at that, at that demand as well. Um, we collected data for, for two weekday periods, uh, the midday, including, including the, the midday lunch, lunch hour and a little bit into the afternoon, and then evening from five o'clock on up to, up to 9 p.m. Uh, we looked at those two time periods for weekday. On Saturday, we also did a, a midday period on, on Sunday, we did a morning period to overlap uh, with, with potential church activity and, and other weekend activities that could be taking place in the morning. Uh, we, and we did a general review of, of parking demand for on and off street areas um, in, in the residential areas, um, as well as collecting all of that data for, for on street parking areas. So that was, that's our, that's our occupancy data collection to see what percent of the parking is occupied by vehicles. If it's 100% occupied, that's full. If it's 0% occupied, that's entirely empty and available for people to park in. So that's when we say occupancy, um, that's what that means. So divided, I divided this up into the tasks that we've completed and the, and the tasks that, that we still have to do. After we have our after we have our meeting tonight, um, this this project runs through about August 
of this year is our is our planned uh, completion date for the project. So we're kind of in the middle of it right now. We've just collected our data and we want to present that to you tonight and, and discuss it and discuss your issues as well. Um, so we've completed that inventory of all the public parking supply in the city, um, all of the on street roadway segments, the public parking lots, the off street lots and the major corridors uh, for those four time periods. Uh, we've done that outreach to com community members, which I mentioned um, with the with the residents uh, residents and the and the businesses um, kind of in those in those focused uh, stakeholder meetings. So what we what we have coming up is to further analyze this collected data. What we've done now is we've collected it and we've summarized it. Um, so the next steps would be to kind of focus in, uh, break this down a little more, look at look at those neighborhoods and districts, and get into um, prioritization of uh, management um, improvements for, for the parking supply. We're gonna be looking at the future land use effects, including second units. Uh, many of you know the second units um, became le legal at the state level, and a lot of, a lot of uh, residential properties have developed second units. Uh, there's also the regional housing needs assessment that the city must go through um, as a regional planning effort. Um, and there's a potential for 1,800 uh, more units to come in uh, with, with both of those. Uh, we're looking at a 10-year projection of, of parking supply to look at the future. Um, that will be kind of based on the specific plan and, and based on, on downtown land use regulations. But also there'll be a sort of a second smaller scenario that we'll do some estimates on to look at kind of the aspirational goals, especially in the downtown area and see what those effects would be on the parking supply and what management tools or additional supply uh, would be needed, particularly in that area. So we'll be developing standards for, for changes of use when um, when a new use comes in, either in the downtown or another area, do we want to have uh, new standards for those uses uh, based on how the how the conditions look with the existing land uses? That could be a regulatory change that comes out of this. Uh, new projects uh, what might be affected by that by location or or shared parking and the mobility network that's available around there. Um, that that could be that could be one thing that we look into. Um, another thing we'll be doing is looking at, at, at trends and patterns across our time periods, across neighborhoods, um, conglomerating, which is basically just a fancy word for, <laughs> for putting this data together into those neighborhoods and block groups and trying to, trying to see how that supply works because you may, if you don't have parking on, on your block, you may go to another block, but we wanna, wanna look at how that works in terms of neighborhoods. We'll be getting into management. Um, Management is anything from, from time limits to uh, potential permit, um, creation of, of permit districts, and also pricing recommendations, uh, changing some of the pricing that's there now, and potentially expanding that uh, based on the comments we receive um, and, and how we work this out toward the end of the, of the project. So the, the project, uh, the Parking Management Master Plan document, the PMMP, in the end will be presented to the Transportation and Safety Commission and the City Council. That will be toward the, toward the end of the project after we've done uh, more analysis and a, and a little bit more outreach. So those are, those are all of our tasks, uh, current and future. I'll hand this over to uh, Catherine to talk about our outreach activities to date. I'd like to just do a quick presentation, a quick announcement because I see we have new attendees. Um, if you prefer to hear the presentation in Spanish, please look at the bottom of your screen. You'll see there's interpretation available. You would click right on that and you would hear it directly in Spanish. Um, in terms of questions and answers, you can submit your questions and comments anytime during the meeting and we will get uh, respond to them during this meeting. Uh, you can do that by just entering the Q and using the Q&A function or texting if you're listening on the phone, um, please feel free to text um, at 818-810-7311, 818-810-7311.
So as Brian said, described the technical analysis that goes into this project, I just want to make sure that you know that the to have effective solutions, it takes both the technical analysis and the community input. And that's the part that we've been involved with even before this meeting, just to come up with a, sort of a, a broad understanding of what um, is going on in the city. We have been talking to people. We provided uh, seven presentations to different commissions and associations, including the San Fernando Mall Association, uh, Parks, Wellness and Recreation Commission, Planning and Preservation Commission, Education Commission, Business Neighborhood Watch and Neighborhood Watch uh, attendees, uh, and Transportation and Safety Commission. And then again, we held uh, two rounds of um, stakeholder interviews where we had representatives from the business community and from uh, residential groups. And uh, those were particularly just to give us a basic understanding of what's going on in the city. What's most important is your attendance at this meeting tonight. And this is where we get to hear from you. And we'll go to the next slide. So uh, just to give you an idea of what else we've done, um, we created a website and then launched uh, awareness campaigns and social media on February, during the month of February, 2021. And um, through that, we received 176 comments. Again, this is the tip of the iceberg. You're here tonight to get to really fill in much of what we've learned. And here we are on what we have learned so far, and that is, um, most of the issues and concerns um, related to the bullets that you see there. And first off, overcrowded residential parking was brought up time and time again. Uh, more parking is needed for businesses was also stated. Uh, parking time limits and the need for permits uh, was also brought up. Uh, impacts on traffic due to lack of parking and safety and security were concerns parking fees and costs, and parking around parks were all cited uh, most frequently from the 176 comments we received. And now I'll turn it back to Brian. I was, I was thanking you and I was introducing the next slide. Okay, let me go again. <laughs> Sorry, I had it muted. Um, so yeah, thank you, Catherine. Um, so I'm going to go through and go through this this slowly rather than overwhelm you with this with this data that we've that we've collected. We wanted to show this in some in some clear manner um, and, and and show you what what we've done. But I, I want to kind of give you a background on this first. And someone had, had posted a question, and then and I know a lot of you have the question of okay, we're doing this parking study. While COVID restrictions are in effect, and, and Nick was was talking about that in the beginning, how we had the the challenge of just when we started the study that the, the COVID restrictions went in, restricting uh, travel to some extent, or, uh, restricting commercial activity, uh, restaurant and retail indoor capacity, um, all of that, as as we all know. So. So we had we had project deadlines, uh, funding deadlines to get some of this done. Um, some of this was done after some of the restrictions were lifted, uh, not all of them, and they're still not all, all lifted, um, even as we go into the yellow tier within Los Angeles County. But um, what what was done was that we we waited. We were going to originally collect data in fall of 2020. We waited um, until some restrictions were lifted. And one, one caveat to all of this is, this is not a study that's going to get published and you're not going to see any updates to this for, for 10 or 20 years. It's not going to be the parking plan. Um, the city is already looking, looking for funding uh, for not, not sure when that will occur. Uh, they'll keep trying until they get the funding um, in, a, in a future year um, when, when COVID restrictions are lifted to, to do an update to this. Um, we know that the residential data may be a little high because a lot of people are, are at home, uh, working from home or, or working different shifts. Uh, just, just a generally more residential parking demand than normal and the commercial parking demand is generally lower. So we, under, we understand that. Um, 
so we, we waited, but we had some February deadlines in the in the grant funding for this project. So, so what we did was we started the residential uh, data collection in early February. Um, by by later February, some restrictions were lifted. This was like the, if you remember, this was like the first lifting of, of major restrictions and started to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Although we haven't we haven't reached the end of the tunnel yet. <laughs> Um, so we, we waited on the commercial surveys in, until late February because some of the restrictions became, um, were, were lifted at that, at that point. And, and as we drove around into our surveys, we noted that's when downtown was starting to, to close San Fernando Road um, in the downtown area so that you could, have, you could have people walking around, you could have outdoor dining, and some of that was coming back. And there is definitely, definitely that activity was returning. It's not what it was in, in 2019 or so, but some of that came back. So we've collected that data kind of under, under the best conditions that we could based on the project schedule. But something that we also did, and I'll show you these, these factored downtown maps as we get further into this data. Um, city, city tax data is collected for, for different uh, business um, industries in, in the city. Uh, we looked at those, and some of some of it's collected on a geographic level, so that the city understands activity in different areas. So we looked at that, um, different areas such as as, as the downtown McClay corridor. Um, they were down by by 25% in some areas, 50%. In some areas, also for retail and restaurants, there's similar percentages. So what we did was was we did some factoring of that. Um, it's not not shown on this map, but it, it's shown in later maps. We did some factoring based on that to try to try to show more normal data um, to show a better picture of that. So, so with with that all said, I'll I'll go through these through these maps. Um, so this is this is unfactored data. This is our weekday <clears throat> afternoon survey data. Um, so as I talked about occupancy. When we get up into this 100% level where we have red colors, that means parking parking was full uh, when we looked at it. We have these off-street parking areas, these colored dots, which are the commercial businesses along the major roadways, and then these um, these lines are the are the roadways. So we summarize the data within that segment between the two cross streets. Um, so blue blue areas are areas that had either uh, no parking demand at that time. Everything was open, or there's there's parking restrictions there where you can't park, uh, such as along uh, Truman Road, as you as you go through the through the downtown area and some other areas, as well. So these are these are the patterns that we saw, and things we'll be looking at is is over here, um, for example, along San Fernando Truman Road, um, in the in the west side of, of of downtown, getting down into into Workman Street and some of these neighborhoods between there and San Fernando Mission Road. Uh, we have these, these red and orange areas. We'll be, we'll be looking at these um, and kind of putting this data together to see how this all kind of functions. You wanna have, you wanna have neighborhoods and districts where there's, where there's parking available, uh, obviously just for, just for comfort level quality of life, but also it can, be, it can also be a, a, a traffic issue where people are, are circling around to find that spot if you have Parking occupancy at about the 85% level, that's about where you want to be in terms of maximum. That gives you about one or two spaces per block or one or two spaces per row of a, of a parking lot where you can you can pull in and find that spot and not be circling because that just that adds to the aggravation of not having parking and then you're driving around more. So that's some of the theory of, of parking, why we look at this kind of higher level at the orange and red level where things are at 85% or higher. Um, so in the, in the north area of the city, um, some of these corridors in the industrial area, this was midday. So these, these, have, these have high parking occupancies around Glen Oaks and McClay. Um, some of these neighborhoods here uh, further north as you get up toward the north end of the city, uh, 10th Street and higher. Um, we, we see these, these red and orange areas in the west side of Glen Oak. So, so these, are, these are areas we're gonna be looking at in a, in a little more detail. This is, this is one time period. And we can, we can go back to these if you, if you have more, more questions on these. Um, in, the, in the weekday evening, we did, we did more surveys. Um, if I can 
flip back here and, and show the southern side of the city south of downtown. Uh, for example, um, I flip back to the five to nine period. Um, this, this data shows when people have all come home <laughs> after, after work days, if they, if they work off site um, out of the city or uh, away from home, uh, they've come home for the evening. Um, and you can see that in this neighborhood here east of McClay. I'm going to flip back to the to the midday period and then go back again to the, the evening period. You can see these areas fill up and that, that happens basically throughout the city in the, in the residential areas. So those are some of the things that we're going to be looking at too. Um, here's here's the data for for Saturday afternoon um, in the in the downtown area. Uh, we, we, we see high parking demand. We see high parking demand within the, uh, the private lots um, for and, and, and along First Street here even as well, um, high parking demand. Um, so we want to look at that correlation between on street and, and some of the, the off street to see where there's really potentially not enough parking uh, for, the, for the commercial businesses. Are they creating uh, more overflow onto, onto local streets? And the downtown parking lots, and we need to work on that as a system. Uh, this is this is Sunday morning. Uh, this was done between the 9 a.m. hour and the and the noon hour. Let's see. So this is south of downtown. Just for for an example, uh, looking at Saturday afternoon versus Sunday morning. Uh, let's look at let's look at first first street, fourth street up in the up in the middle area of town. Let's go back to Saturday. Um, a, a lot of orange and red in some areas, but it, it, it uh, goes up and down between different streets. Um, Sunday, you can definitely see, um, especially in the in this core area to the west of McClay, um, how how Sunday morning when people really haven't gone out for weekend activities yet, are, are still in for the morning, haven't haven't gone off to work. Um, you, you can see the high demand there. So this kind of a variety of different time periods gives us a good um, view of what's of what's going on throughout the city. So our factored data we did for for the downtown area using that kind of 25 to 50 percent uh, lower lower tax um, amounts for for businesses. Uh, we use that factoring and and raise the data that that um, that we collected so that we could we get a better picture of things. So these, these red areas are showing estimated, um, and this is this is definitely true for for the San Fernando Road going through downtown and in the core areas where you have that diagonal parking next to businesses uh, showing high high occupancy. Uh, the lot the lots to the north along uh, along Truman are, are showing high occupancy, a little bit less uh, toward the toward the south, and and we know we know that's generally the case uh, that these lots. Are generally not as well used, um, but we'll want some input on that to, to potentially factor that further. Uh, we know that the lot along San Fernando Mission Boulevard, um, across from the supermarket south of south of Penny's, uh, the, the, the Penny's building, we know has a little bit higher demand. So this is this is our factored demand for downtown. We'll look at that for uh, the weekday weekday evening. Generally, similar results. A little bit higher demand. In the in the lots next to next to Brand Boulevard, I want to go back for a second. Weekday afternoon, um, high demand over near Huntington, Lazard, um, along San Fernando, McClay, and a little bit a little bit further south, getting down toward Pico Street. Um, and then looking here, uh, weekday evening a little bit a little bit less, um, but the lots the, the city lots have the same kind of pattern. Um, in the downtown area that we were seeing in the other peaks. I'll move on to, to Saturday, also showing the same general um, peaks going on in, in those areas of downtown. Um, something I, I didn't cover is that we looked at, we looked at weekday um, and weekend parking turnover. We, we had these four time periods that we looked and said, Let's let's look at vehicles that are parked in in one space within each of these areas. All we did was we just noted the last three three uh, digits on the license plate and the, and the make of the car. We didn't get any other <laughs> identifying information, um, but we looked at to see are 
are people parking for a long time, meaning that employees are, are taking a parking or, or are these visitors or customers? Um, so we're gonna look at that data some more. Uh, we have some, we have some higher, higher amounts in the parking lots, which is, which is fine. Uh, we just wanna make sure that, that, that customers and visitors can, can park close to, to businesses and along, along the streets, you generally have that um, in, terms of, in terms of these values. But when you get to, to four to six hours, uh, we may wanna look at encouraging that parking to move, uh, parking demand to move further out so that uh, people close to businesses can use it other than employees. So that's another thing that we've collected that we're gonna be looking at in a little more detail. So this was Saturday data, Saturday afternoon showing about the same data. We didn't get into detail on this for Sunday since on Sunday mornings, the, the downtown is just, is just coming up um, and, and that, the activity and the, really the activities in the afternoon and the evening on Sunday. So that is the data we collected and some of the things that we're gonna be looking at. We can get more into this in the, in the question and answer period, but wanted to give you that overview of the data that we've collected. So some of the issues and strategies uh, we're gonna be looking at, uh, Janice will be presenting this portion. Thank you, um, Brian. Um, I, I'm Janice Rhodes with JR Parking Consultants. And we are tasked with uh, working with Brian of now that we have all this data, uh, what, what does the data tell us and what do we do with it to uh, translate that into a parking program that will uh, allow the city and the community to begin to uh, develop um, from the toolbox that will provide uh, a parking program that will begin to ease those uh, challenging areas, whether they be residential uh, areas or whether they be the commercial area. And um, we have not defined specific recommendations for areas as of yet. And I'm going to talk about at a high level kind of uh, those tools in the toolbox that are available uh, to a community for developing their parking program. These tools come about by our uh, looking at uh, the city's existing municipal codes for parking and traffic and what you already have uh, developed and available for your use. We look at what is um, authorized from the state through the uh, vehicle codes in California. And then we look at industry standards, uh, parking industry standards, where we're looking at the entire country's um, uh, development of uh, municipal parking programs and uh, we'll tailor a toolbox of resources for you to be very specific of what will uh, be helpful to the city and the community of implementing your parking program. Uh, we define them uh, in a municipality in two general areas. One is what are the tools that we can use for the residential community to manage uh, those on-street uh, residential parking spaces. And then we have the commercial uh, tools and resources that will allow the, the city to manage the on-street parking uh, spaces as well as any parking spaces that are located in public parking lots. And um, so I'm going to talk about those two general areas and then what's available for commercial property owners uh, and their own toolbox of what they can do of uh, that's available to them for managing the parking resources that they may have in their own uh, private parking lots. In a residential area, uh, the most significant tool that we have uh, in San Fernando in the state, in the parking industry around the, the country is the development of residential permit parking districts. Uh, you already have in your city, the, um, uh, the codes and the structure in place for those to be uh, implemented within your city. Um, that is a defined district that is exclusive for the residential areas only. It allows the residents to petition to the city uh, to add or create uh, their own individual blocks or surrounding blocks uh, within a uh, permit district uh, so that the city then has the tools to 
enforce a parking program uh, that restricts the use of those parking spaces to just the residents and uh, their guests. And it, it eliminates the non-residential users that may be occupying and taking up the spaces and taking away those valuable assets that the residents need to have. Um, that is a process that's petitioned. The city staff then does an evaluation and it's approved by the city council prior to an implementation. It does require that once that petition is in place, that each resident uh, is allowed um, a certain or limited number of permits for their own vehicles and a uh, set number of permits for the guests that they may have during the year. So uh, while it is, it is a very useful and effective tool, it does have some, um, some things that the residents will need to do and self-administer with the permits for those spaces to be available. Um, the rest of these point, bullet points, I'll talk about the commercial areas. And as Brian and Nick both talked about, we were a, a bit challenged of having with COVID, um, I think as effective data as Brian and I would like to have had of occupancy and, and use of the commercial areas and, and within with any um, public parking program, uh, cities, and I work with cities where every two years, uh, every five years, they will update their accounts and adjust their parking program uh, to be um, responsive to the needs and changes in, in uh, both their residential and their uh, commercial districts, but the change most often takes place in the commercial districts. And um, the city's um, realm of responsibility of managing, as I said, was, is the on-street management tools and the public parking tools. And that generally starts with the most basic um, uh, program. And then based on the sophistication and the occupancy over time, we typically start with on-street spaces and parking lot spaces where we will have time limits uh, that really respond and reflect to the um, time that customers need for using those spaces. And the intent of that is to keep those valuable on-street spaces for high turnover for guests and visitors to those businesses. And we try to shift then the longer term parkers and the employees into off-street parking locations uh, and have longer term parking uh, time limits within the parking lots. Uh, we, and you all can identify with neighboring cities as we go through uh, stages and stages of development, the progression of an on street and a city or a commercial parking district as we go from time limits to pay parking to, um, you know, more sophisticated uh, and it depends on how much demand availability and as Brian talked about demand, meaning how many people are trying to access the limited numbers of spaces. One of the ways that uh, all cities will manage that uh, demand is through time limit and or uh, parking pricing where they adjust the pay rates when they implement uh, pay parking. An example might be that you have been in cities where they may have parking meter rates that are 50 cents per hour um, all the way up to some uh, very dense areas where they may be three or four dollars per hour. So it depends on uh, the city and the area and, and how um, high the demand is, how high the occupancy is, how many employees do we have in a downtown area and the management tools that apply in managing those resources. We also in that toolbox, uh, the best way for, there needs to be a balance and a partnership between the public management of public spaces, as well as the management of the private spaces uh, by the private property owners. Um, we don't want a situation where if the city implements their uh, own street tools that it then pushes parkers to park in private space and then those private property owners don't have use of those spaces for their own needs. Uh, so uh, private, 
uh, property owners have tools available to them where um, the city can assist in uh, helping them to sign the parking lot appropriately and then provide the appropriate parking management uh, for those areas. And as I said uh, from the start of this, this is just the high level um, tools in the toolbox that are available to cities. You know, our next steps, and Brian will talk about this, but we'll be looking at the data that we've collected and Brian has shared with you. And most importantly, all the comments that we received from these community meetings uh, previously and tonight uh, to help in developing the toolbox that will best meet the needs of the uh, city. Brian, next slide. Yep. Thank you, Janice. So yeah, um, so we have some we have some contact information to share with you. But I, I wanted to I wanted to address something that I was saying earlier about the maps. That was that was a test when I said that there's 10th Street and higher in San Fernando. There is no 10th Street, so I was I was testing everyone to see if they'd comment on me. Uh, um, so yeah, when I was referring to the north end of the city, obviously I meant Glen Oaks Boulevard, 7th Street, 8th Street. Just wanted to clarify in case anyone. Thought I was making up street names. Okay, so we have our project contact information here, and we'll share this at the end as well. Uh, Thelma Herrera is our is our lead outreach uh, manager, handling all the communication on the project, logging comments, etc. So we can get a big picture of everything that's going on. Her her email is here on the screen, and the project website is also um, on the screen as well. Uh, within the project website, you can you can provide comments. Um, you can write in comments uh, there. Uh, for people on the phone, the website is sfcity.org slash sfparkingstudy. Um, and, and if you'd like to contact us, we can, we can email that to you if you can't see the screen or if you can't uh, write that down at the moment. Um, you can also on that website, um, Go to a map that's on there. You can you can add a point. You can add a line if you want to show a whole street and and add an issue there that, that you want us to look at and, and to be considered. So that's the information there. And again, we'll have that we'll have that up at the end of, of the meeting if you need to to see that again. And we'll move on to our our question and answer period. Uh, Thelma, you are or Kathy, you are guiding this. Yes. So I Thanks. just want to make sure that you know you can enter questions at any time we have some we've received some so again use your q a function and for those that are uh that prefer to hear the meeting in spanish or submit your questions in spanish uh you can do that um use the interpretation key at the bottom of the of the zoom page or just text us in either language to 818-810-7318 I'll repeat that, that's 818-810-7311. So we'll now start with uh, questions and answers. Most fun part of the meeting. Okay, so I'll read them and then we'll have some answers. So um, here, here are the questions. Why doesn't the city enforce their own building codes? And that was the question. I'm going to read uh, the response from Mr. Uh, Nick Kimball, the city manager who responded, but I wanna make sure you hear it and have a chance to, to hear everything that was has gone on tonight. So Mr. Kimball re responded, please report any potential code violations to our community preservation division at the contact info below. And it's Jose Luis Regosa, R-A-Y-G-O-Z-A, -A, Community Preservation Officer. His phone number, and I'll read this twice, is 818-898-1228. That's Mr. Regosa, 818-898. 898-1228, you can contact him or you can send him an email at L Regosa, R-A-Y-G-O-Z-A 
at sfcity.org. I'll go on to the next one. There was a question submitted in Spanish. I am concerned that the community does not realize much about these meetings it's the same when they build and do not take the community into account. That is why today in Glen Oaks, they removed the parking lots from the community and the city until um, and the city and they removed it and the t until today has not communicated with the community. So the community can't ask them to return the parking lot. It hurts other residents. The city needs to be more transparent with all people. And then um, that was a question submitted in Spanish. Um, here's another, uh, it was also another comment. Look at the actual development in Glen Oaks. So expensive to buy and without parking. We need a study that helps not only harms the community, please and then answered question and response. Here is question, um, let's see. We notice many faded no parking signs throughout the city. Will these be replaced or updated? That's the question. And Mr. Baumgarten, who is the, uh, Matthew Bar Baumgarten is the public works director and he responded to this question. Again, the answer is, Staff will be going through and identifying all the signs and start to work on replacing them over this year. Okay, there's another question. Here in Glen Oaks, speeding has increased because there is not parking on the side and they feel free to speed. Soon you will see a tra tragedy. We want parking back on Glen Oaks between Brand and McClay. And again, Mr. City Manager, I have been waiting for your call since November. Um, that was submitted to us in Spanish. Um, here's the response. Um, hello, is it possible to have, oh, there's another question. Um, hello, is it possible to have street sweeping at earlier times? Since there is some schools that have staff and parents who have a hard time looking for parking. Mr. Baumgarten, responded, thank you for your comment. I will have our staff look at the street sweeping hours near our schools and see if we can make some schedule adjustments to avoid morning or afternoon sweeping. Now, um, let's see. Here's another uh, question that was asked and answered. Has the city of San Fernando considered purchasing the parking lot property located at 1511? San Fernando Road. That's a corner of San Fernando Road. And we're not sure if that was Lazardi. This lot can possibly be used for public parking. And Mr. Kimball responded. Thank you for your comment. Unfortunately, since the state of California eliminated local redevelopment funding in 2012, the city has not had the resources for property acquisition. We continue to explore grant funding for property acquisition and we'll keep this location in mind. And here's another question. I'm reading all the questions just so uh, you know all attendees know what's happening. We received a number of questions and they were responded to by either Mr. Kimball or Mr. Baumgarten, Gardner, again, the public works director. So here's another question. Why do city improvements such as Glen Oaks Boulevard, McClay, Tesla Station always result in parking spaces being reduced? Mr. Baumgarten, again, the director for public works responded. We understand that there may be some loss of on-street parking spots during city projects, but we aim to minimize their loss while also working on improving traffic safety. On-street parking can sometimes be lost when adding features to roads to calm traffic, help reduce collisions and protect pedestrians.
Um, I'm going to ask my staff person if any other questions have come in. Uh, Jamel, have any other questions come in tonight? Oh, here we are. How much is this parking study costing the city? Mr. Kimball responded. This study is being funded 100% through a grant from Southern California Association of Governments, sometimes called SCAG. There is no direct cost to the city for this study. How many, here's another question, again responded to by Mr. Kimball. How many parking enforcement officers does the city have? How many total hours of the week do they work? Is there parking enforcement officers in the evening and on Saturday and Sunday? Does the city have an adequate number of parking enforcement officers? Mr. Kimball responded. The city currently has two full-time and two part-time parking enforcement officers. As we begin to implement some of the recommendations in the final parking management master plan, which is what we're working on tonight, we will look into increasing our parking enforcement resources at the same time. Another question, is there a city ordinance as to how many cars a residents can have? Mr. Kimball responded, there is not currently such an ordinance. However, that may be one of the recommendations that may come out of this study. Parking meters need to allow cash or change, not just credit cards. Mr. Kimball responded, most of the city's parking meters currently take change only. We're implementing a multi-phase project to upgrade all parking meters to take cash and credit cards over the next few years. Um, here's a comment. Appreciate the presentation. My question was, how was outreach to the community done? My family lives on the south side of San Fernando. They did not receive any notice about this important meeting. I can respond to that. Um, we, um, we submitted, um, we did a number of things. We worked through the city's channels of communication. That means we um, used, uh, submitted both um, press releases that went out. We submitted social media messages and I know the city sent them out through their channels of communication. We uh, did e-blast to our project list. So if you submitted any questions, if you visited the website, we had your contact information. Um, we also made um, announcements to the commissions. Um, we um, uh, distributed flyers at local businesses. Uh, and we also, I wanna also acknowledge we had the help of community residents that helped do that. Uh, the other thing is we also uh, ran an ad in the um, local newspapers. So I'm sorry you didn't see it, but um, please sign up. And if you give us your email, we'll be happy to keep, keep in touch with you. Another question was, um, how accurate is the data given if it was collected during the COVID-19 crisis? Please respond, Brian. Right, yeah, and I, I think that came in uh, before our, our presentation on the data, but uh, just to reiterate in, in, in a short short description is that we we had we had some project deadlines to get some some funding. Um, we had to, we had to basically basically invoice our, our data collection by by the end of February for the for the grant. So we we waited until some of the restrictions were lifted and, and phased in the the data approach so that the commercial areas were surveyed last. Those were done in late February after the initial county uh, lifting of restrictions. Ad additional restrictions have been lifted since, but we weren't able to collect that data. So. What, what we used in, in lieu of, of collecting and using that data, which, which is understated for the, for the downtown area, the commercial areas, we, we factored up the data based on, based on sales tax records to provide a little, a little bit more realistic look at, at the downtown area. We did not do that citywide, 
but we did do that in the downtown area. So as we go through it more in the future, we'd like to get comments on how realistic that looks for how things might have looked for you in, in, in 2019 or how the data looks to you. So, so please comment on your specific issues in, in regard to that. And like I said, the study will be updated in, in future years with, with new data um, as, as the city can get the funding and as, as restrictions get lifted. So this, this study will have updates. It'll be a live document with future updates. This is not the data we're gonna use for, for years and years. This is just the initial, um, an initial approach at uh, some improvements to parking. Okay. Thank you, Brian. We also had a, a comment from one of my staff persons who reminded me that we also sent uh, electronic flyers to all the schools part of our outreach effort. And many of the public schools in San Fernando helped distribute flyers at home to parents um, electronically. All right, um, here's a question we received via text. And again, if you wish to text, we wanna read that number again, 818-810. 7311. I have three questions. Number one, what's a courthouse parking? Why is a courthouse parking not being used for people going to the San Fernando courthouse? People attending court hearings are taking over residential areas. It would make sense for courthouse attendants to ask for proof of parking before offering services in the courthouse. That was one question. Um, would someone, uh, maybe I'll read all questions and then uh, I'll revisit them. And uh, Brian, you can uh, ask someone to respond from our team. The second question is, why is Third Street only one-sided parking? I went to City Hall to ask this question and was told that this street is not wide enough, which is not true. Adjacent streets are smaller and have parking on both sides. So that's the second question. Number three, what will be done to enforce parking regulations and better safety measures once students go back to school? I've seen parents stop in the middle of the street in front of the police department and have their kids run to the sidewalk rather than pull over and park. Okay, so uh, Brian, I'm gonna field that to you. So the first question again is why is the courthouse parking not being used for people going to the um, San Fernando courthouse? People attending court hearings are taking over residential areas. It would make sense for courthouse attendants to ask for proof of parking before offering services in the courthouse. Is there anyone that would like to answer that from the city? I can I, I can start and see if see if the city wants to see if if uh, Nick or Matt want to want to add something. But yeah, the, so the the courthouse area and the, and the civic center area are kind of you know adjacent to each other and they blend together a little bit but maybe looking at those in terms of separate areas in terms of, of how we see the data and what's what's going on there and how they should be operating and come up with specific tools look at that as a neighborhood or as a district and and come up with the right tools to help manage that we'll look at the the regulations there some of that is out of out of the city hands because it's uh it's a county facility being a county courthouse and, and their parking would be owned and operated by the by the county as well. But in terms of interagency cooperation, um, there, there may be solutions that the city and the county could work on, but the city might want to add something to what I just said. Thanks, Brian. Just, just to add that there actually is, that's one of the few areas in the city that we currently do have a parking permit um, program. Um, so uh, residents in that neighborhood do have priority uh, to park um, to the extent that they have a permit. So uh, that's something that we'll be looking, you know, citywide or expanding that program through, uh, through the, the, uh, the recommendations in this uh, study. Again, and the second question is, why is Third Street only one-way parking? Yeah, we will. We will. We will look at that. Um, we know. We know that a lot of the residential roadways are are challenged with with a lot of with a lot of parking demand. I, I saw it in driving around as as part of the surveys, collecting my own data, but also just kind of making observations. And so, we know that a lot of, a lot of neighborhoods are 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 
are experiencing a heavy demand, which, which can affect how you, how you get around. Um, understanding Third Street may only have, have parking permitted on one side. Um, we'll look at that again as one, a supply issue, but, but what, what could be typical uh, for that area and what, and what could be changed if, if the supply can be enhanced by, by adding parking. Um, that will do a lot for that neighborhood, but we'll look again if you're seeing that that roadway is just as as wide as other as other roadways. I don't have those dimensions, but we'll look into that um, and see if see if there's a solution there. So, thanks for that specific issue. Good and I know. think um, just to Brett on to add on to that, uh, Brian, I think any some of these you know we won't have an answer at yeah. hand for a lot of these questions. So any uh, you know a lot of this will just be feedback that we'll need to take notes on yeah. and we'll incorporate as we look through, you know as the consultants uh, finalize the study. So. You know, thank you for those comments and, and yes. knowing to get frustrated if we don't have answers right off the bat, but we will, um, we are taking them all down and, and we'll be incorporate them in the final study. And again, uh, the third question, what will be done to enforce parking regulations and better safety measures when students go back to school? Again, I think that's one we'll we'll take that. We do have um, in San Fernando Middle School some of our higher. Uh, um, we do have parking um, crossing guards uh, in some of those 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 higher traffic areas. So um, that will resume when school resumes. Um, and, and, uh, but we will take that comment under advisement. Okay. Um, does the city have resources, infrastructure, and parking to accommodate one thousand seven hundred? 91 new units. Right. Um, yeah, go ahead, Brian. I, I, I'll, I'll take, I'll take a, a first stab at that one. I know that's yeah, in ahead. reference to the, to the, uh, the regional housing needs assessment uh, numbers that the city was allocated by the state. Um, and, and that is a, a statewide, all cities have been given these sort of astronomical numbers um, that from a practical standpoint, um, you know, will be a challenge, uh, uh, obviously, to to meet those numbers. Um, but again, those are sort of a uh, those are a statewide mandate. So we are, um, you know, working to see what we can do to um, at least address some of those um, in San Fernando. That, that's I think this is where I can plug the housing element update, which is actually um, running sort of parallel to this effort. Uh, we are having housing element uh, that the housing element of our general plan is actually what will, you know, create um, the the planning and zoning the underlying zoning to potentially be able to to um, look at those those renet numbers those housing numbers. So uh, I would encourage anyone that's interested in the housing portion of it to uh, be engaged in our housing element outreach. I believe on. I think May 12th, I, I believe next week, we actually have a housing element uh, public meeting. So please look at our, check our website, www.sfcity.org um, to participate in uh, any of those housing related studies, uh, uh, public um, outreach studies that are, that are going on right now. So thank you for that comment. The next question was um, asked and answered. We wanna make sure that everyone hears it. Um, the question was, why are some curb restricted parking areas like fire hydrants not painted? This will help people not getting tickets and visibility to identify they should not park there. And Mr. Baumgartner responded, similar to the need to replace faded signs, staff will be working on making sure that curbs that need to be painted or repainted due to fading occurs over the next year. What solution do you have in place for other San Fernando city edge areas in which the non-city apartment residents use the residential street for overnight parking? Yeah, and that and that that that's come up a, a lot in the, in the especially in the stakeholder meetings and talking to people that that live kind of on the northwest side of the city toward toward the city of city of Los Angeles over toward Hubbard. Um, Feel the, their their perception as well is that and, and their experience is that is that there's demand coming in from the city of LA um, and, and coming into the into the neighborhood. 
Um, so we, we understand that. We're going to look at those, those specific areas because we've had a lot of comments about that um, to look at, look at potential management solutions in those areas along the edge of the city. And here's a comment. I love living in San Fernando and just knowing that you're willing to review parking issues is moving towards the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, another texted question and answer. Eighth between McClay and Harding, big problem with homeowners renting rooms. Some have homes that have 10 cars, others have seven cars, et cetera. Yeah, so some of some of the data we've we've collected and, and we're going to incorporate that more into into our future reporting is is we've we've looked um, around neighborhoods, you know, you know, from the street. We're not we're not going out of people's property, but <laughs> looking around neighborhoods to see how many vehicles are parked in driveways. Um, I don't I don't have that that data on the on the figures right now, but we're kind of looking at uh, summarizing that in terms of averages and, and maximums for each uh, neighborhood of the city. Um, but yeah, I've seen driveways with with four or five cars and a, and a few houses in a row where there's where there's really high high parking demand for for single family homes. And we know that happens with with apartments as well. So <clears throat> we understand there's there's like a high parking density and a high density of people potentially per per residence. Um, that's driving a lot of this parking demand. So what we're going to be doing is using that data that we've collected um, from from looking at looking looking at driveways of how many cars are there to see it are, are those in, in high demand areas. And then we know that something has to be done um, because that that demand is also also spilling into the street. Um, so potential solution. Um, in terms of like a parking permit district as, as one solution is, is to get people to get all their cars on the property, whether that's at nighttime or, or all day, um, it, it, it forces kind of a management of, of those vehicles, gets them off the street um, and they, they have to deal with it or, or reduce, their, reduce their number of vehicles that they have. So, that's a potential solution to, to some of that. And we, we recognize that as an issue. We've documented that. And here's a question. When considering moving towards residential permits in the future, is there a way homeowners can claim primary permit parking for the parking spot in front of their own house? The single parking spot in front of my own house is never available. Neighbors who own multiple cars and or have no space on their own lots always park there. Yeah, that's that's one of the the most frustrating things of, of neighborhood parking issues when there's when there's high demand is that you, you can't use the space in front of your house. Uh, Janice might be able to, to expand on this or the city might want to add something, but in general, parking permit programs, if that's the solution in some neighborhoods, don't don't allow you to kind of reserve the space in front of your house. Um, it, it becomes a bit of, of, a, lo lo of a logistical problem um, and, the, and the, the parking is still public on the street, but there's different ways of implementing uh, parking permit programs and uh, Janice might want to expand on that. Brian, <laughs> you started what I was going to uh, respond to and that is that, you know, that, that on street uh, spaces on a public street is a shared resource for all of the public to have access to. And unfortunately, um, the codes don't allow designation of a specific space for a specific resident owner, because that becomes making it a privatized space. Um, and, you know, to, to, to do that, it, it, uh, there's all kinds of other uh, legalities that have to be sorted through and most all cities that I've worked with, whether it's in California, Southern California or outside of the state, um, do not get into designating on-street spa spaces for a reserved use. However, when you implement you know, a residential permit parking program 
and you're putting a cap on how many permits each household may have, that uh, then means that there's more availability of those on street spaces, which makes it easier for the residents who live there to find spaces closer to their home. Thank you, Janice. Um, the next question is, we have a nightly onslaught of Silmar apartment residents who park overnight on streets adjacent to Hubbard and take every space from residents. We're unable to find parking in front of our own homes. Also, this, these people park on Fridays and leave cars, RVs, construction trucks, et cetera, over the weekend. We demand city parking by permit, same as other cities have. So that's a comment. Yeah, thank, thank you for that comment. Yeah, that, that matches some of the comments we were receiving in the, during the stakeholder group meetings, especially toward the Hubbard side of the city and where some of the denser uh, residential areas are with apartments that are, are um, grandfathered in in terms of their parking requirements or they're not, they're not allowing spaces being used on the property. Some have storage. Some are using it for, for other things. So there's some solutions that, that need to be looked at specifically for those areas. So we recognize that. Okay. Um, here's another comment. Does the city have, or a question actually, does the city have the resources? I think we, we addressed this one already. I see it already. Does the city have the resources, infrastructure and parking to accommodate uh, 100, 1,791 new units, and I know Mr. Kimball responded to it, so I'll move on to the next question. What about underground parking in the downtown area or even a parking structure if needed? Yeah, so that will that will be part of, of basically the tools that we look at. Um, obviously, you want to you want to look at management tools first because those those create the least um, cost burdens. On the city to provide to provide the public parking if if management tools such as different regulations and and time limits on parking um, expansions of those areas or more stringent time limits if those if those do not provide enough supply in our analysis we'll be looking at recommendations to increase supply along with that that's kind of the second tier so um, I know there there are some comments on going underground some on on going up in structures. Uh, structures are, are a little bit um, cheaper. It's hard to say it's, a structure is cheap because any anytime you're building something more than surface parking, it's expensive, but going underground is the is the most expensive. Although you do have an opportunity to, to provide that, provide those spaces along with the development that could be at, uh, on top and, and have a shared private and, and some public parking in the bottom. So there, there could be some other solutions we come up with as we look at, at, at the supply side of things that could include uh, targeted structures in some areas. Okay, in general, how much does each residential permit cost? I, I know now the city does not to, does not put a cost on those, but with a larger program that could increase. Janice, do you want to talk about typical fees that that you've sure. in other city? You're right. Uh, currently, the um, uh, city provides or allows those permits that for the existing districts to be free. Um, if you if the city uh, you know goes to a full blown um, kind of citywide permit program. Um, the state, you know, the, the ordinances and state laws allow the city to only cover the cost of, of uh, implementing the program, the permits, the signs, things like that. It, it, it is not a profit center uh, for anyone to use. And most cities, uh, those permits that I've seen can be quite low uh, to the tune of, I've seen them as low as $12 a year. I've seen them as high as in some urbanized areas where they may be $50 a year, but it's it's not a daily or monthly fee, it's an annual fee. Thank you, Janice. Um, 
there, this is a lot of information. Can you tell us again, what is the final deliverables for this study? Thank you, it'd be greatly be appreciated. Yeah, understood. And I appreciate you all listening as we as we go through just a mountain of information and, and data. So um, one, one part of that question, we'll, we'll have this presentation available. Um, we'll have that on the on the city website and we'll also have a video of this if you if you'd like to go back and look but we'll basically have a copy of this like in a like in a pdf that's you know easily accessible online you can you can go through the slides as well if you want to look back at at some of the data that we were going through but our our end deliverable on the on the project is a is a management plan for the city and that's that's going to summarize the data we've collected it's going to have these figures with a lot more explanation <laughs> than what we've gone through today it's going to have targeted areas recommended uh, both through our analysis and, and through input from the from the public, including the input we're getting from you today. Um, but basically that deliverable is a, a parking management plan that's going to have recommendations that the city can can use uh, to manage manage parking in the future. So it will, it will have all that data, it will have targeted areas, it will have maps that show recommendations, it will show the type of tools that are being recommended. Um, if, if there's recommended uh, residential parking permit districts, it's not going to implement it because the city still has to go through a process. As an example, for the for the parking permit districts, um, but it will have a framework and some initial recommendations that the city can use for that. So that will be in fall of this year um, after we have more outreach um, in summer. Um, and then that draft document will come out um, toward toward fall, and that will that will basically summarize um, all of this that we're talking about. Thank you, Brian. I want to acknowledge that um, we said the meeting would last till seven thirty, but mm -hmm. definitely as the questions oh. keep coming in, we want to stay and respond. So, um, it, I just let you know. It's not over yet, so we still have a few more questions. Um, how can the city address the increase in rental properties and the congestion congestion they create for street parking? I'll 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 start on the on that response. So, rental rental properties create a, create a certain density um, when there's potentially a lot of people per unit. Uh, density of, of persons per unit that can happen in, in owner occupied housing as well, but we understand uh, we've gotten comments about about rental housing in particular. So all of that, all of that is, is a density issue. Um, nothing, nothing can be done directly to control population per unit. Obviously, the city doesn't have that, that, that kind of control. But some of these tools, such as such as the, the permit districts can can force people to manage um, this kind of vehicle fleet that, that they have for their for their residential unit. Um, force them to either manage it, get it get it on site, or or reduce the amount of vehicles they're parking over time. So that's the goal of some of these measures. I, I'm not going to say that's that's going to directly affect that, but it'll better manage it and provide more space for others to use in the in the public parking supplies. I don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. We'll continue. I live on 8th Street, the very edge of San Fernando, very north edge of San Fernando. The Silmar apartment re residents take up our street parking. Is parking permits the only solution? Um, yeah, we that that's our that's our go to answer in, in some in some in some ways for for the residential areas. And maybe Janice wants to ex expand on that. But there, there, there aren't a lot of tools that you can use in residential areas. For a commercial area, there's there's a lot of tools you can use because, as you know, the downtown has its has its loading areas. It has its limited time areas. It has it has within the civic center. You have the parking meters. You have the the pay lot next near city hall. Um, commercial districts have a lot more tools just because you can use pricing. You can use time limits. Uh, those those don't work well in in residential areas but 
there's a lot of different types of residential districts that that can be implemented. You could have you could have just overnight parking be restricted that a lot of cities do like like two to six, I think is typical at night. Um, and during that time, you have to have a permit if you're on the street, otherwise your car is illegally parked. So that that controls overnight, but it also kind of gets a rhythm in, in how in how parking is managed and gets people to to uh, kind of come in line and uh, stop stop overusing the parking supply. But you could also have all day permits. You could have it during certain days, along with time limits for people that that don't have permits. So there's different ways of, of implementing it, but you kind of have to start with the permit district in the residential area. Do you want to add anything to that, Janice? To uh, complement what you've already said, Brian, you're absolutely right. When the residents petition for their street to be included in a residential permit um, district, um, they, through work with city staff, establish uh, the days of week uh, that the time that the permit district will be in effect, the hours of the day uh, that it would be in effect, and it's intended to solve the residential problem. And one of the issues um, that can be done in that is you can limit the number of permits per household, which also um, takes into account with apartments and kind of multi-unit uh, facilities, how that's addressed as part of that permit district. But it also helps uh, where we've heard questions uh, about the spillover from the city of LA uh, into San Fernando streets. If those streets become San Fernando uh, permit districts, those residents that live in the city of LA will not be able to come into San Fernando and purchase or obtain permits uh, for parking on San Fernando streets because there is a process when this is implemented that those residents who are requesting the permit have to provide some uh, identification documents to show that they're the owner or the occupant in those households and provide um, things such as um, identification documents, utility uh, documents, et cetera to show that they are properly authorized to be able to obtain the permit. So that's how we manage the program. So we don't get, or we don't issue way more permits than we have spaces to be able to accommodate. Okay. Um, here's another comment. Mm. I've been hearing for years about the residential parking permit as a potential solution, yet no action has been implemented. How can we as a community help put these conversations into action? The parking is so bad on my street, that's Warren Street. I can't have guests over and I'm considering selling my house. I would say home, it sounds like people have lived there for a long time. So I, I just wanted to note that comment. Yeah. And that um, yeah, let me, let me read that again. Um, yeah, so the, the, the city has a few park, parking permit districts now. Some are, some are like a, a block or two long. Some are, some are district, but it's never been implemented on a, on a, a comprehensive level in a, in a plan. So the, the plan has the goal of, of making that work better by, by looking at those, at those areas that are there now, looking at the need and making recommendations, those will likely be be modified as part of this. They'll, they'll they'll go into larger areas so that that your neighborhood that you live in, where you feel your neighborhood is, you know, the few streets north, south, east, west, that should all operate as a neighborhood. They, they shouldn't be be small um, small districts because it just it just has spillover effects for neighboring uh, roadways. So this plan is the goal of of helping taking that further. And having better better parking district solutions. So I understand you've been through years of this, but it, this is really trying to take a better comprehensive look at it. The, the, the city's been 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 forced to kind of take a reactive stance um, as as people have petitions for for permit parking and deal with those areas. But this will be a, a larger 
a larger look to, to get this further. So taking part in this study is, is helpful. We appreciate that. Documenting the issues that you see in your neighborhoods, that's going to be documented in the study and give, give the city the, 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 the input to, to take those residential districts further and really make them work better. So that's the goal. Is there a city ordinance for RVs, campers, flatbeds, and utility trailers parking on residential areas? There seems to be an increase in oversized vehicles parking on street parking. Um, just yes, uh, yeah, real quickly, and, and maybe Matt can jump in. Uh, I I believe we do have a time restriction that parking that vehicles can't be parked for more than you know it, it may be uh, seventy two hours. I, I don't know the vehicle code right off the top of my head, but if you do see um, a vehicle that's parked in the same spot for many days in a row, please contact our, um, our police department um, and they will, uh, I think it's 818-898-1267 uh, and let them know uh, and they will check out the vehicle um, and make sure that it is following the current uh, parking uh, laws. And that response was from um, Mr. Nick Kimball, the city manager. Uh, let us know if you'd like us to read that phone number again. It, it was the city uh, police department. Yeah, it was 818-898-1267. That's our non-emergency line. Um, when the auto attendant come, answers, you can always dial zero and that will connect you directly with a um, one of the city's dispatchers. Okay, thank you. We need the city to provide machines or an office to pay for parking fines because some residents do not have a bank card to pay and that is a community need. And that, I just wanna say that comment came in in Spanish. So we'll um, document that. Another question, when will you have the final solution to the parking management? Looking forward to residential parking permit. Any idea on range of cost? Did we cover that one by talking about the range of fees on parking permits, or is this a different comment? I, I think it's it's how much will um, how much will they cost, and I think you can just briefly uh, because that question has come up several times. Uh, again, cover just briefly uh, how much they cost because and, we just want to miss that. Before you do, I think the first half of this question was asking. Um, Similar, like when when will the study be done? I think you had mentioned mm -hmm. in the presentation August or September. So you know we'll be looking at about the um, the fall when we'll be you know kind of dig, digging into these different recommendations. So I think that there are a few different people that had questions about when they'll be implemented and how they can get involved in actually implementing these. I think you know uh, September October as those come before city council, uh, that's that's a good time to be involved to to start you know, assisting with getting these implemented. But that was just the first half of that question. Thank you, Mr. Kimball. Dennis, do you mind briefly going over just the range of costs again for parking permits? Mm -hmm. um, this, as, as we, st both Brian and I stated earlier, currently uh, the permits that you have in the existing um, re two residential permit parking districts are, there's no charge associated with it. However, um, I've seen many cities, if, if these parking permit districts expand and become um, uh, a lot more complex and comprehensive and uh, providing solutions, cities, cities are only allowed to, under the state law, to charge for the cost of issuing the permit and the associated signs to put in place. They're not allowed to charge for the enforcement cost, uh, you know, street markings and things like that. It, it's very isolated cost and it's very um, specific to those districts. And what I've seen in Southern California of other cities, uh, it's an annual permit fee that's applied for either annually or biannually 
Uh, most cities will charge for the residential permit, may have a nominal fee for guest pa passes are free, but it's generally a range of $12 per year per permit uh, or uh, up to, I've seen as high as 50 where there's uh, significant uh, complexity to their, uh, their permit programs. But uh, um, I think it would be on the lower end in San Fernando. Those are, those are annual fees. Annual fees, okay. yes. They're not daily or monthly fees. They are annual fees. I just wanna say we have two more comments and um, then we're going to wrap up, but I wanna thank you for hanging in there. Mm -hmm. um, so here's the one, uh, another one. Um, if we opt to park in our own driveway and not participate in the permit program, will we still be responsible responsible to share in those costs running the program? Yeah, in, in general, I, I think no, um, because um, you're paying for you're paying for the permit. So if, if you don't need a permit, if you're not going to use the on street parking, if you can manage all the vehicles that you own on your on your property and park on your property, um, no need to park overnight or during the day when the when the restrictions might be in effect, you wouldn't need to to pay into that, I believe it's only when you require a permit that you would yeah. be paying into the program. That, yeah, Brian, that's typically correct. Yeah. Um, but I've seen residents that if they plan to park their own vehicles in their own driveway, still may request a guest permit for guests that's when good. they have them to uh, come to their home. But again, uh, what I've seen for the most part in cities, those guest passes um, um, are free or they put a cap on it and, and you get a certain number per month or per year free. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't get into that too much and that can be a, a later topic in outreach, but yeah, there's, there's, there's the permits for your own vehicles and then there's the guest permits, which you could have pay for a supply of those. There's a limit to them for the year and then you give those to your guests or you, you pay as you need them. So yeah, there's there's those two different elements of the of the permit program. Okay. okay, we have just one more question and we're going to wrap up. And I wanna let you know that we will, uh, if any questions come in after, definitely we'll get back to you mm -hmm. and also be aware that you can also uh, click into the website, we'll give you that contact information. We'll also give you an email and you have our text. So continue providing comments if you wish, uh, but we are gonna wrap up. Okay, next comment. The city gives permission to certain people to park on the land, but property owners are not allowed. That is not fair. The law applies to all, not some. So on that comment, I think we're going to wrap it up. So thank you again for the comments. And uh, again, whatever comments we receive, be sure, uh, be just be very confident that we'll get back to you, I promise. Mm -hmm. Okay, Brian? Yeah, so we appreciate you you staying. I was looking at how many how many people are still here. That's great, you stayed, stayed over time. You committed to 7.30 and we're here at whatever time it is now. <laughs> Um, so so th thank you for that. Thank you for staying to hear our responses and provide your comments. And you know, if, 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 if you, if you want to add to those questions, please do so through the website or through the, the links that we have here. More information is always better. Uh, part of this study is, is mapping out where, where we've had these issues documented by, by the stakeholders and the public um, so that we can target improvements. So, um, again, if you want to provide more specific locations on the website or just through a general comment, please do so. We'll be mapping all of that for the for the later report. So uh, we appreciate those comments and, and keep them coming if you have more information to provide. But yes, thanks for, for joining us today. Um, we appreciate all the comments and all the input so we can, we can really make this a, a study for you. So we appreciate we appreciate that you joining us tonight. And I think that's everything. Um, Brian, just a quick thing. Yeah. Don't we have uh, another slide with contact information? Slide. Yes, let's go back to that. Um, yeah, we had a slide about, about project next steps, but we've, we've talked about some of that through yes. the fall of 2021. So yeah, here's the uh, contact info and the, 
the uh, video on demand for this meeting will be posted uh, soon on the city's uh, YouTube channel so that additional information is here. And we will leave that there uh, if you'd like to uh, to write that down or, or note that. So we, we appreciate you coming tonight and, uh, and thank you very much. We will see you again as we move forward. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.